Thank you. Um, so, hi, I'm Sophie Watson. I work at Red Hat as part of a team of forward deployed engineers. So we focus on helping customers solve their business problems using data science and get their machine learning and their AI workloads running in the cloud. Over the past year or so, I've been thinking quite a lot about recommendation engines, and today I want to share with you some of the thoughts and ideas that I've had, and specifically, I'm going to point out hurdles that we've had to get across and issues that we've seen along the way. I'll also suggest some fixes and some potential solutions. Many of the services, companies, and products that we interact with on a daily basis are now providing personalized content to users and giving personal recommendations to us. And if there's companies out there who aren't striving to give that personalized experience, then it's pretty likely that they're going to fall behind in their market pretty soon. So the types of recommendations that are made to us as users come from a huge range of applications. Um, Spotify, for example, curates daily playlists for me. So if I log in, I can see um, a suggested playlist grouped by genre. There'll be a pop playlist, a classical playlist, an indie playlist, and so on. And these are a mix of songs that I've listened to previously and I like from that genre and other songs that I haven't heard of before, but they fit well into that playlist. Apple knows that last month I bought an iPad, so all of my adverts and emails are now suggesting that I go out and purchase some very expensive adapters, which mean that I could plug my iPad into just about anything. And video streaming services make perhaps what we think of as more classical recommendations using our listening history or our uh, watching history um, to predict which films we should go ahead and check out. But underlying all of these forms in which I see recommendations made to me, there's some recommendation algorithms. So if you look at the literature on recommendation engines, all of the algorithms out there are evaluated on how well they perform in terms of minimizing some error. And there's an assumption that lower error means better real-world predictions for users. In practice, that's not really the case. So these underlying metrics or errors are things like log loss or mean squared error, and they don't necessarily directly correlate with what we as users uh, want from our experience. They're just not capturing the full picture. Once you put your recommendation model into production, it's true that you can see how users interact with that, and then you can go ahead and improve your algorithm based on the way in which users are behaving. Um, but for today, we're going to think about the stage before production, and we're going to th think about some things that we could do to improve recommendations before we get going into production. So we'll start by talking about the problems which recommendation algorithms don't usually address. And to do this, we'll introduce alternating least squares. So this is a very widely used recommendation algorithm. From there, we'll see what problems in recommendation are not solved by alternating least squares. We'll, select, we'll suggest solutions for some, and we'll dive deep into the problem of data drift. We'll talk about a solution which uses approximate set similarity to make recommendations, and we'll see how these set representations enable us to make sensible and robust recommendations to users with an added layer of intelligence over that initial alternating least squares algorithm. And we'll see how this is done in a way which scales nicely as the number of users of a system grows. So let's start with alternating least squares. Alternating least squares, or ALS, as it's more affectionately known, is the industry standard recommendation algorithm. And there's off-the-shelf implementations that you can plug and play, written in Scala, Python, and R. In its original form, the algorithm itself deals with explicit data. So if we stick with the movie streaming service example, an example of explicit data would be something like user one gave film the five three stars. ALS then takes this data and puts it into a matrix, like so. And you can populate that matrix with any other recorded data that you have. From there, we're ready to implement the algorithm. 
alternatingly squares factorizes this matrix into two smaller matrices. It does this by some iterative process that for the purposes of this talk, we don't need to worry too much about today. But if anyone wants to talk in more detail about ALS and how it works, then hit me up offline. So one of these two matrices represents the users, whilst the other represents the items, or in this case, uh, the films. So each row of the user matrix corresponds to one user. Each column of our film matrix corresponds to one film. Once the algorithm has factorized the data into these two matrices, it becomes really simple to go ahead and make predictions for a given user. So if we want to estimate how user one would rate film two, we can do that by simply taking the dot product of the row corresponding to user one with the column corresponding to, to film number two. And the ability to estimate how a particular user will rate a particular film enables you to do things like re recommend the 10 films which a user will most like. Alternating least squares also allows you to identify users who are similar to each other, who have similar tastes. If we look at rows of the matrix of users and we compare the similarity of them, then we can do that by comparing the vectors in the rows and in the same manner we can compare uh, movies by looking at the columns of these matrices and identify movies which the algorithm deems similar. And this might help you save some computational costs. So for example, if you knew that two users were exceptionally similar and you'd already computed how you, one of them would react to a particular film, you could just represent that recommendation to the other user. So that example was for explicit data, but what if our data is implicit? If we think about the music streaming service uh, scenario, what does it mean if you listen to a song? So say I listen to a song once. Do I like it? Right, we don't know. We have no idea. If I listen to a different song 10 times, you would like your algorithm to be much more confident that indeed I probably like that song. And moving on, if I listen to a song 100 times, then we want to be even more confident that I like it. So there's an implicit version of ALS which works on such data. It requires that you define a mapping from your recording to how confident you are that the user likes that item. So in our case, this would be a, a mapping that mapped from number of plays to confidence. But other than that, it's pretty much the same as the, implicit, the explicit algorithm. Okay, great, so now we can deal with explicit data. We can deal with implicit data. We can quickly make point recommendations to users. Um, and we can identify similar users. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you should just go ahead and push your alternating least squares recommendation algorithm to production. So in this next section, we'll think about what alternating least squares is not providing us with. If we go back to this image, we see that we've got our two matrices, one for users and one for products. But what happens when a new product is added to the market? No users have rated that product yet, so we don't know how they're going to interact there. And because the components of these feature vectors in ALS don't correspond to explainable features, we can't just go ahead and generate one for this new film. We need that ratings data in order to be able to predict the feature vector for the film and thus make recommendations. And in the same way that products arrive, some products go off the market or fall out of favor with the whole population. So this might be for political reasons, ethical reasons, or it could be because of a media storm or so on. And out of the box, ALS doesn't handle this. Alternating least squares also doesn't take into account changes in users' opinions over time. So it's not uncommon for people to have the same accounts now for years and years. I've had the same Spotify account since 2008 and basically used it daily, but my change in taste in music is very apparent um, and the music I listen to is much broader now. And alternating least squares just does not consider that at all. There's not just one way in which 
tastes can change. So we usually think about change in terms of aging and I'm much less likely to listen to club music now than I was when I was 18. But there's also some seasonal changes in taste. So this might be seasonal in the tradi traditional sense. Um, people only watch Christmas films in December, for example. And the type of music that is often released in summer and thus that people listen to in summer is tragically different from the things that are released in winter. But you might also see changes um, that indicate seasons of life. So there's likely some correlation, positive or otherwise, between a change in someone's relationship status and their interest in romantic films. Another thing which ALS can't handle at all is anomalous recordings. So these crop up perhaps when you just hit the wrong star rating when you're watching a film, or maybe there is some real anomaly in your opinion. Perhaps you hate all horror films except for one. Alternating least squares is unnecessarily sensitive to these anomalous recordings. So in the algorithm, anomalies are fed back into the main matrix, which is then used to create your user vector. And as such, all of your future recommendations are influenced by that one anomaly. So although ALS can provide us with these personalized recommendations quickly and easily, it would be nice if we could solve some of these issues that it doesn't address before we ship our engine to production. Now, some of these problems can be simply solved by post-processing. So if we think about the ALS algorithm as our model, it takes in data and it returns recommendations to users. A post-processing microservice could be placed in between the model and the recommendations and solve some of the issues. For example, we could use it to filter out these seasonal recommendations therefore not recommend Christmas films in July, for example. It could be also used to ensure that you recommend any new or any promoted products to the whole population. And the outdated products are never recommended. Now, you probably just don't want to remove all of the data you have about outdated products from your data store because these do give you insight into how the user may react to other products. So we do just want to filter those out at the post-processing stage. What we can't do with post-processing is use it to identify changes in user taste. So it's not able to figure out which products or media will spark nostalgia and identify those from the ones that you don't mind if you ever see again. It can't tell if you watched a load of sad breakup movies in a very short period of time or whether you actually just quite like sad breakup movies and you watch them frequently. And it's not able to identify any anomalous behavior and then prevent that from influencing these recommendations further. So luckily for us, there's another class of algorithms which we can use to make recommendations. And these use composable signatures. In this next section, we'll introduce the class. We'll show why it solves a few more problems. Um, so let's go back to our music recommendation scenario. Here we have three users. The first two users have mainly listened to the same stuff. So I think, I hope you would all agree that it's reasonable to recommend to user two that they go out and listen to Billy Bragg and recommend New Order to user one. But if we look at user three, they only have Taylor Swift in common with the other two users. So we're much less likely to tell users one or two to go and listen to Spice Girls or recommend that user three goes out and buys the Smiths greatest hits. And in fact, there's a very nice statistic that we can use to quantify this level of similarity between two sets. So this is known as the Jacquard Index, and it's computed as the union of those two sets over the intersection. So if we were going to compute it for users one and two, we'd see that they've listened to the same artist, four of the same artists, and they've listened to a total of six artists between them. Hence, their Jacquard Index is four six. For users one and three, they only have one artist in common, and between them, they've listened to nine artists, hence we get a ninth. 
And if you compute your Jacquard index for the music history of lots of different users with user number one, then you can identify users that have similar tastes to number one. And as such, you can recommend some music to number one, which would be songs that the people that they were deemed close to have listened to, but they previously have not. So now we have a way to numerically quantify the similarity of sets. But storing all of the artists that every user has listened to in a set is not very efficient. So we can extend this idea of storing a user's music history in a set by storing it in a bit vector. So here, each bit or box, as they're shown, um, represents a band or an artist, and the bits are set or colored in if the user has listened to that artist. If we compute these for every user, then we can compare users by comparing their bit vectors. And the Jacquard index of bit vectors is computed in the same way as it was for sets. So the intersection is just how many bits are set in both of the vectors. In this case, it's three. And the union is how many bits are set in any of the vectors. In this case, it's 10, hence the Jacquard index is 3 tenths. Bit vectors provide a much more efficient representation of sets than the set themselves, but I probably haven't yet done them justice. So one really nice property of bit vectors that we really want to capitalize on today is that they're composable. What that means for us is that it's very easy to merge these bit vectors together. So suppose user one listens to music not only on their computer, but also on their phone. And each device keeps track of a bit vector for itself. It's really easy to merge these into one global vector for the user and gather all of that information together. Or perhaps you want to keep these two bit vectors separate. So maybe the user listens to podcasts on their commute to work on their phone, but listens to music once they're sat at their desk. And so you can use those bit vectors that are separated to go ahead and make relevant recommendations on the appropriate device. But it's still nice to be able to obtain simply that global overview of the user using the joined vector. Where this composability really gives us great improvements over alternating least squares is when we use different bit vectors for different time periods. It's these time-dependent bit vectors which allow us to do things like map changes in users' behavior over time and identify the music that you're going to keep coming back to again and again and ultimately figure out what's going to spark nostalgia. So you could keep a different bit vector for every month, every day, every week for a user. And you can see the changes in behavior there. You can catch new trends. And you can see what songs people keep returning to. Now, sadly, we can't just stop there. This isn't yet a functional solution to our problems for a couple of reasons. Although the bit vectors take up a lot less space than explicit sets, the downside is that you have to visit every bit in the vector in order to perform the set operations. The Jacquard index is still relatively cheap to compute, but the real problem is that to find the most similar users to any given user, we'd have to compute an unacceptable number of Jacquard indexes. Spotify has 217 million users. So even if you want to compute the similarity between just one of them and all the other users, it's going to be really expensive. So what's next? So the algorithm that we're going to use to solve our problems here is called MinHash. MinHash is widely used for identifying similar documents at scale, but we'll see that we can use it to determine set similarity, and we'll also use it to make recommendations. MinHash takes that massive vector, which indicates the artists that the user has listened to, and maps it down to a much smaller structure. We call this a MinHash, MinHash signature. So how do we generate one of these? Well, what we need is n hash functions, where n is the size of your min hash signature. So here we have five of them. And each of these functions maps to some large set of numbers. To begin with, every entry in the, bit vec in the min hash signature is set to infinity. 
And what we do is we move along the bit vector until we find a set bit. The first bit is empty, so we carry on. When we reach a non-empty bit, we do the following. So what we do is we first look at what number bit that is. If I use computer science counting, then that's bit number one, because we start counting at zero, apparently. So I pass that number, in our case one, through the hash functions, and each of them returns an integer. We then update the min hash signature to take the minimum of, for each row, what's already in the signature and the new number. So the minimum of six and infinity is? Sweet. OK, so we kick the infinity out there. We put the six in. The minimum of 12,048 and infinity is? All right, I'm not going to, OK. So hopefully you get the idea of how we get started with minhash. Next, we go back to our bit vector, and we keep moving along until we find the next set bit. So in this case, it's bit number four, because we start counting at zero. And we pass four through each of these hash functions. And we then just compute the minimum of what's already in the vector and what the hash functions gave us. So in this case, we'd update the second and the fourth rows if I start counting at one in that case. Sorry for any confusion. So we continue this process, and what you end up with is a minhash signature for your user. Oh. So minhash signatures are, by construction, shorter than your bit vector, so it's faster to compare two minhash signatures than it is to compare two bit vectors. And the way in which we compare minhash signatures is that we just count the proportion of elements which are the same in both of them. So in this case, we've got two matches there. Um, so the similarity here would be deemed 2 fifths or 0.4. Now, a minhash signature is an approximate representation of a set that allows us to compare those sets. It is possible for two sets which are not the same to have the same minhash signature. In practice, this very rarely happens, but it's worth remembering that you're never going to underestimate similarity with minhash, but you may overestimate it. For recommendation purposes, this overestimation isn't going to cause us too many problems. If we think about what we do once we have identified similar users, we'd go back to their bit vectors, and we'd take the difference of the two bit vectors. We'd look at which songs one has listened to that the other has not, and from there we could make recommendations. So the pink bits here represent the, the artists that we would recommend to the other user. Suppose we looked at the difference between those two bit vectors and saw that it was actually large. In such a situation, we'd likely overestimated the similarity, and so we'd take a step back. So now we've got a way to compare two users without having to make as many pairwise comparisons. And minhash also has that composability property that the vectors had. So if we have minhash signatures for a couple of devices, we can combine them just by taking the row-wise minimum. And the process of computing these minhash vectors doesn't actually have to start from the bit vector. You could just hash based on the artist's names or the song names, for example, as they're streaming in. So this gives you a nice way to quickly update your minhash signature as the user is using the streaming service. It also helps out when you're thinking about the issue of adding new um, items to the market. We don't have to change the size of our minhash signature. We can hash whatever we pass in. So that solves the problem of us having to compare huge bit vectors, but that wasn't really the problem that we cared about. That wasn't where the computational drain was lying. We still haven't made any headway on trying to reduce the number of pairwise comparisons which we have to make in order to find these users that have similar behavior. Luckily for us, something known as locality-sensitive minhash exists. So locality-sensitive minhash looks at subsets of the user's minhash signatures, and if any two have identical signatures in any of the subsets, then these users are considered a candidate pair. 
From there, you would go on and compute their similarity or their approximate Jacquard index by looking at their min hash signatures as a whole to determine how similar they are and if you do want to make recommendations. The way in which locality sensitive min hashing works is by splitting the min hash signature into bands. So here we have five bands, each containing two rows. A new hash function then maps from the contents of the bands into some buckets. So for us, our hash function would take in vectors of length two, since the bands have two rows in each of them. If in any band two users map to the same bucket, then they're going to be considered a candidate pair. And we go back and look at the min hash signatures and see how similar the users are. Thus, we only have to compute similarity of the minhash signatures for a subset of the whole population. So if you think about the Spotify case, if we reduce from 217 million potential users that are the same as my music taste, even just down to 100,000, that's a massive computational saving. So minhash and locality sensitive minhash solves a lot of our problems, but Perhaps unsurprisingly, I haven't given you solutions to all of your recommendation problems over the last half an hour. So here's some things that we didn't have time to touch on and some suggestions for how to approach these problems going forward. So the first is that you might have noticed that minhash example we did was for implicit data. We essentially assumed that if someone listened to a song, they liked it. But earlier, we were all in agreement that we're not entirely sure that that's the case. So one way around this could be to only record the information in the min hash signature or in the bit vector if a user listens to that artist multiple times. So here we wouldn't put song A in, but we would put song B and song C. We're introducing some sort of threshold number and we're saying, okay, if you've interacted with this product for so many minutes, or you've explicitly told us that you do like it, then we can make that hash. If the data is in fact explicit, if the user does say, okay, I give this film five stars, we might wanna deal with that slightly differently. So one thing that you could do is keep two min hash signatures for every user. These are cheap to store because they're relatively small. And in one of these, we could have things that we know the user likes. And in the other things we know the user dislikes. I think we could probably all have a reasonable argument that if you dislike some things, there's probably some correlation there with the things that you do like. So that information is still important. You can use it to make recommendations. Or maybe there's... Uh, Yeah, cool. Um, so another problem that we haven't addressed is that of making recommendations in the case where multiple users share one account, who here shares some sort of streaming account with somebody else. Um, so it might be obvious in this case because of different device usage um, that you can identify who is using what and make the recommendations accordingly in the same way that we discussed perhaps someone commuting using their phone and then being static and using their computer. Um, or you might have to do something more clever like trying to cluster users' behavior. And when you think about watching movies, I think there's an extra layer there. So often if you watch a movie with someone else, the movie that you watch might be a compromise of what they like and what you like, and it might not be the same. So from some angle, it's your taste, but head on, not exactly. So we want to see how to deal with this. I would argue that this is a bit of a lesser version of an outlier. And although outliers don't influence all recommendations when using minhash in the same way that they do in alternating least squares, we haven't chatted about how to identify them. So it might be plausible to just look at the n most similar users to a given user and say, okay, we've got this new recording for our user. Did anybody that we deem similar to them also interact with this product in the same way? And then from there, you could decide whether or not you wanted to record that data. 
And finally, we haven't talked about users changing their opinion. So suppose I rate a film highly, and then the next year I change that rating to a dislike. Can you get some extra information from that? So will I now dislike all of the movies that I watched of the same genre in the same time period that I first watched that initial movie? Or perhaps I need to downweight that behavior from that period until we can figure out what's happening. So that's some ideas for the problems that we didn't have time to talk about in detail today, but let's review what we did. We've seen that MinHash gives us a way to obtain summaries of a user's interactions with a set of items. And these summaries are composable, thus allowing us to capture trends and identify changes in users' behavior and identify different behavior across different devices. They enable us to look at a user's listening history over periods of time and make time-sensitive recommendations accordingly. And this is something that we couldn't achieve with alternating least squares. This is really going to help to make any recommendation service more personable, more adaptive, and thus more successful. If this week we see that one of our users is playing lots of breakup songs, we might wait this highly for a while and recommend them more breakup songs until they stop listening to them. And then we might want to be quite kind and remove that chunk of music history from their user history so as to not influence further recommendations. And we also saw how locality-sensitive hashing enables us to identify candidate pairs of similar users, and this prevents us from comparing every user of a system in order to find similar users. So please stay in touch. I think we might have some time now for questions. Um, I'm also around for the next two days, so if anyone wants to chat about recommendation engines, then that would be great. Thanks. I think it was remarkable. Any questions? Uh, in the recommendations, there. Uh, hi. hi, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for the good talk. Uh, in uh, like you said in the beginning that uh, the, the offline measures don't work, and A/B testing works, but A/B testing is like really very expensive, and uh, like uh, so there are some learning to rank matrix, like precision at rate k, map mean average precision which are used in all recommendation competitions. That's right. And they, they are like, they are proved to be useful over time. Okay. And uh, like they also correlate are, and are a good proxy for A-B testing. Okay. Yeah, uh, just to comment. Okay. Uh, and uh, also uh, in the plain vanilla alternating least squares, the mat matrix factorization, uh, there is a way to decay the time and uh, Yes. In the equation, I don't know if you had time to, uh, I mean, that also handles time decay. Uh, the matrix factorization in the beginning, which you talked about. Yes, so that does get worse over time. That's certainly the case. Yeah. Can you explain to the algorithm where you forget old records after time? Yeah, let's chat about that offline. Thank you. I think I missed something in the presentation. Um, how exactly did you tackle the item cold start problem there? Because you talked about it and then um, I think I missed that. Yes, out. so the cold start problem is certainly something that alternating least squares deals with terribly um, because you don't have the space allocated in your matrices to store the information about these new items, for example, and um, whereas, so it would, uh, the algorithm would stumble if you passed it something it hadn't seen before. There are some streaming implementations that are out there and they can be used, but um, it takes a good while to get some good recommendations out of it. I guess the advantage of the composable techniques is because of the hashing there's just no stumbling. You don't have to worry so much. So you would have to increase the size of the bit vectors to acknowledge that a new item had been added to the system. 
but you can use the same minhash signature that you're already using and just update it with this new hashed item um, without it causing a problem. Um, uh, could I read more about this approach in a scientific paper? Published? Yes, yeah. why not? So. Drop me an email and I'll send you some citations. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Please ask a question, not opinion. Otherwise, it's confusing. Uh, I will do a question. <laughs> okay. Actually, I implemented something like this for item item recommendation, not for a user. But I'm curious. How do you handle the fact that a person never listen or never even seen that there is a stream that he can see there? So you Sorry. are speaking about um, a person goes and sees um, an item. Yeah. The question is, if the person never found the item, how do you deal with it? So um, let me just double check. So a person, uh, they just don't know that it exists, this item? Or? Exactly. So okay. in your case, if the person sees a, a video for more than two, three, four times, you say, OK, this is great. The guy likes it. Yeah. But if the guy never found that uh, music, yes. how do you handle with it? I'm seeing myself, for instance, in Netflix. I like some, some movies. But yep. maybe I would like some other movies, but I simply don't know that they exist. Okay. Um, so if, if, if no one in the population knows that they exist, then it's certainly the case they would never be recommended to you. Um, I mean, hopefully if somebody with similar user behavior has... Okay, so um, in terms of when you do your factorization in alternating least squares, then uh, in the composable. Okay, let's let's chat offline and I'll make sure I know what's happening. Um, Thanks. I think this is a problem about uh, exploration and exploitation um, because when a new item is in the system, you kind of want to force it to get the information from it. So you want to show it to some users to get some grades and maybe later put it in a different phase like... I see. So perhaps we could approach it in the post-processing situation as well. Okay. So suggest it to many users. Okay. Thank you. The last one maybe. Oh, thanks for a really great uh, talk. Um, ha have you investigated any ways um, or done any work around uh, potential ways to include context um, and metadata into this, this scheme? So at the moment, it's, it's based purely on the co-occurrence, which is one, you know, potentially one of the downsides of pure ALS. But there's, yeah. uh, you have a lot of rich context around um, th you know, th things like you, you've, you've got a little bit of it there with time and with um, with, with devices, um, but yeah. are, there, are there other ways to include item metadata or user metadata that you've thought about? Is it just a case of having different minhash st structures, you know, grouped by keys, or, or, or are there ways to uh, combine them or build them into the signature, anything like that? Yes, so thanks, Nick, that's a great question. It's absolutely not something that we have implemented, but it certainly seems like it would be possible to uh, investigate what the benefits of keeping different minhash signatures for different genres are, for example, and so on. Um, yeah, that would be that would be good to see. Um, so I've only thought about using that extra metadata in terms of post-processing, really, rather than embedding it into different minhash signatures. So if anyone has any experience in this, let us know, because we'd be interested. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you very much.